Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Byington, and in this video we're going to be talking about John Keats and specifically his poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn. So a little background information on John Keats. Um, sort of much like I said in the William Blake video about, well, these are some of the most anthologized, well-known writers of that age. Many of these authors did not have fame and definitely not wealth during their lifetime. Uh, for John Keats, that begins well before he's a writer. Uh, there, there are unfortunate family circumstances. When he is young, um, around seven or eight, his father dies in, um, uh, in, in a, an accident that would be sort of typical at the time, perhaps, um, because he takes care of horses at an inn. He falls from a horse and he uh, has a skull fracture and he dies from that. Uh, because there were legal issues about his will, it was uh, incomplete. This caused a lot of financial issues for John Keats's mother going forward. And so eventually John Keats does end up um, in the care of his grandmother who assigns him and his siblings into the guardianship of two other uh, uh, semi well-to-do men who are to take care of them. So John Keats, before all these uh, complications, the family's complications, he does get... Um, a, a good start of an education, but that become that comes to an end when uh, the family experiences these circumstances. Now, once he is in the guardianship later on, he ends up going to medical school. He can have a promising career. He's doing well. Um, I can't remember if it's in your Norton anthology or in another source. The uh, Today, the equivalent of how far along he got in medical school um, or after he was essentially almost done would have been something like assistant resident surgeon, uh, something to that degree. Uh, so also remember the surgeon at this time, uh, because the profession then is far different than it is now. It could be an array of different things, setting bones, pulling teeth, but also uh, very grotesque scenes like this isn't, uh, this doesn't come with the knowledge and hygiene of the modern world. So it, this is something that's perhaps often important to think about in Keats' decision to leave the medical profession and pursue writing. So we know that while he was in medical school, his medical notes have poetry scribbled in them. So it's already a, a thought in the back of his mind. Uh, he was already enticed by literature when he was uh, first going to a grammar school as a boy. Now, seeing those grotesque scenes, working in what would have been the equivalent of an emergency room at the time as a surgeon, this uh, this likely gave him uh, thoughts about his own ex existentialism. How soon life can just be gone, how, how life is just fleeting. And he wanted to do something that was more fulfilling to him. And so he decided to dedicate his life to poetry. The thing is, is that that doesn't work out well for him in his lifetime. He uh, has, he makes no money from it. Uh, he has uh, some friends with whom he can live. This is a, this is one of the situations later on that uh, in which he meets Fanny Braun, who was essentially the love of his life. Uh, they were clearly emotionally committed to one another, but he could not marry her for he had no prospects. He had no way of making money and uh, funding having a family. There is a, um, a film made about this a fictionalization, a dramatization of John Keats's life. And in this part of the story, his friend, who is uh, sort of 
a pseudo benefactor helping him out who wants Keats to not go back to medical school, don't go back to that profession, um, keep writing poetry, do the quote unquote romantic thing and be a writer. Keats really, really wants to marry Fanny Braun. And in this scene and the depiction in the film, uh, the friend says to John Keats, but what did, what will you do if you give up writing and you go back to medicine? You're just going to uh, be doing medicine so you can make a living so your wife can get fat and you can have screaming kids. You'll have no true beauty in your life. But if you're a writer, you will always be living by that. And I'm paraphrasing that, but that's what his friend says to him. And Ultimately, what ends up happening uh, while well, John Keats is uh, only 25 years old, he ends up dying from tuberculosis. Uh, it's assumed he probably contracted it uh, while he was nursing his brother, who also died of tuberculosis. His mother died from tuberculosis as well. Um, and that was actually a thing that he and Fanny Braun had in common. She also had several family, close family members who died from tuberculosis. But in that time, it was sort also sort of like who didn't have family members who died from TB. Um, he leaves to go to Rome, Italy in the last five months of his life. Uh, to, he is uh, riding along with a friend because remember he, he ha doesn't have his own means to put a roof over his head, keep a roof over his head. And uh, he has to go because that was essentially the only medicine at the time for consumption or tuberculosis was to go into a warmer climate. And <clears throat> so he leaves essentially knowing that he will never see Fanny Braun again. And, um, it's assumed that his final edit of his poem called Bright Star, which is dedicated to Fanny Braun, was written while he was on the ship en route to uh, Italy, where he will go on to die. And he's actually, um, he's buried in the same cemetery as uh, the ashes of Percy Shelley. One of the, oh, there's one more thing I need to say about his death before I go into uh, the poem itself. Right after his death is when his fame begins to flourish. So during his lifetime, uh, critics really railed him. He was not popular. Uh, his work was uh, mocked and is assumed lesser than. But upon his death, uh, one of his friends who had been sort of like a pseudo benefactor for him uh, places an obituary and a couple of um, top uh, top shelf uh, uh, journals. And then across the next couple of weeks or longer, there are uh, one figure I've seen says that there were up to 52 obituaries about John Keats, poet. And so once you have that many in, out in the world, if it's all if all of these obituaries are commemorating the very young poet who has died at 25, uh, people get curious and they want to go read his work. And then all of a sudden, now that he's deceased and it's so tragic because he's so young, uh, all of a sudden his his work is very popular. Now, um, your poem in particular is Ode on a Grecian Urn, and I have a couple of pictor um, pictorial examples here for you. And that's just to kind of show you this narrative, what the narrative might have looked like. We can assume that this comes from a visit to the British Museum uh, that Keats takes with a friend. And... Um, Another piece of his is also about the same trip uh, uh, on, <clears throat> on seeing the Elgin marbles. So these are all things, and, you know, you've probably seen the memes before, like, making fun of the British Museum for sort of essentially having stolen most of the everything that's in its collection. Uh, so these are a lot of things from uh, from Greece 
from the ancient world in their possession in that museum. And that's what Keats is writing about. Now, one thing <laughs> before I go into the actual details is don't forget what kind of poem that this is, an ode. There are many poems that begin with the word ode, or they, they let the reader know that they are some sort of ode. Usually it is in the title. Uh, Keats is known for his uh, top five odes. So this is about praising something, um, making it sort of last forever by paying homage to that something, whatever it might be. In this case, it's the narrative that's taking place inside the picture. Let me go back to that. The image on the Grecian urn. Now, this is a type of poetry called ekphrasis. And if you watch other videos on ekphrasis, you will also, I want to address, you will see it pronounced about three different ways. I just say ekphrasis. Um, the definition of what a crisis is, though, is that it is a piece of writing. It doesn't necessarily have to be poetry. It could be a monologue in a play. It could be a passage in a piece of fiction. But whatever it is, it's describing some kind of artwork. Now, there is something called notional ekphrasis, which is the exact same thing, except that the artwork it's talking about doesn't exist in real life or we don't know for sure if it exists in real life somewhere lost to time this is something this falls along the lines of something called appropriation so you know how uh we have adaptation like film adaptation so when you have cinematic adaptation, that's usually that we've taken a story from a book and we are transferring that information into the cinematic form. So we're telling the story in a new format. Appropriation is similar. It is a type of adaptation, but appropriation, the important word about it is that it borrows things. It, um, you, another narrative, story, whatever, is loaning something from itself to the appropriation. Um, <clears throat> this could be like um, in, with the comic book movies. So if we have a comic book movie that is just like it's a narrative that um, everyone is familiar with from that particular comic book universe, an appropriation might be to take one character from that and make sort of a spinoff. Um, you could say that with uh, the uh, the Walking Dead. So there are some spinoffs of that. Like Daryl has his own show now. So uh, that's an appropriation. It's borrowing something from the larger creative entity that existed before. Now, the way Ekphrasis is working here is Keats is sort of creating a narrative. There is a narrative that exists in every image, but Keats is elaborating on it. He's speculating what it is. We see that in these five stanzas. So in stanza one, you have just a general description of the urn. He calls it a, a few different things. He calls it uh, unravished bride of quietness. So it has remained in this sort of virgin, untouched, unbroken state. And a foster child of silence and slow time. So time going by slowly and that silence like it's just quietly been waiting on the british museum to steal it and put it on display um but really it's just been not saying a word because urns can't talk as time passed so there's your silence and slow time and it is also a historian a sylvan historian so sylvan meaning uh rustic and so this urn 
can tell us something about the past that comes up again in stanza five in the sort of overall uh, message, the value of the urn. But in stanza two, we have the living narrative within the image. And you, you have the uh, description going on about uh, there, there seems to be a young youth, uh, thou fair youth beneath beneath the trees, thou can, canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare, bold lover. Never ever canst thou kiss this winning near the goal, yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss forever wilt thou love and she be fair so there is a fair youth who is apparently trying to reach and kiss a young woman but because this image is frozen in time he never mm -hmm. actually gets to kiss her that's your line of uh he's never winning he's winning near the goal but it never actually happens but the speaker here in the poem says, you know, do not grieve for that. Even though you don't get to kiss her, you're frozen forever in this moment. And she remains fair and you always remain beside her in love with her. So we have this expression in um, the literature world called the page is alive, but the author is dead. And I talk about this when I talk about writing. So when you are writing an essay, if you are talking about something outside of the book, let's say you were going to write about Ode on a Grecian Urn, anything you would talk about that is literally from within the poem needs to, you need to talk about it in present tense because the narrative never dies. So the page is a lie. But the author is dead. So if in the same essay, you were comparing something about this poem to John Keats's tragic biography, you would use past tense when you're talking about Keats because he is dead and anything from his time in history that would need past tense as well. So that's what that means. The page is alive, but the author is dead. It's the same thing within this urn that he's talking about in the poem. Okay, stanza three, um, really sort of the peak of the ode. Ah, oh, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu. So he's saying like, this is so wonderful because, because in the stanza before this, he told the fairy youth, here's why you should not grieve because you get to live in this moment forever. And now the praise is really, um, uh, the ode is really praising the whole moment. So um, you never have to grow old. You never have to leave spring and summer for the cold months of winter. Things never die. And then in stanza four, we start to wonder about the setting of this. The speaker is asking things like, what little town by river or seashore? or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious moor. So he's wondering like, where could this take place? And the thing is, is that this, this is likely a, a sort of narrative in that image that could be placed in many different places in the ancient world. Now stanza five, it has this very famous line, beauty is truth and truth beauty. But what does that mean? So this is the overall value of what this urn means to us. Why do we put things on display in museums? Because there is insight if, into ourselves to be gained. It is a sort of existentialist uh, perspective of why you would even care at all about things like this being on display for you to enjoy and look at. Art, just like literature, just like this poem that is talking about a piece of art, an urn, 
it allows us to look into the past. And if we can look at the past, it can help us evaluate our actions in the present and then guide us in the future. So it's a tool. It's a key to being better people and achieving things that everybody wants, like happiness. Okay, that's it for this video. Thank you.